So last time we looked at latches and we noted that the interesting thing about latches is that they have an internal state. But there was a limit to what we could do with latches, which is why today we're going to actually extend that concept a little bit more and take a look at flip-flops. You're watching episode 9 of Logic Components. Hello and welcome to Logic Components. Now, before we begin to actually talk about flip-flops, which are the main thing we want to look at today, you first need to understand some additional concepts. And the first thing we need to understand is the concept of a clock. Now, here's the deal. In, let's say, a computer or just, you know, a device that is somewhat more complicated than single logic components, chances are you have multiple components working together and they need to communicate for the whole system to actually work correctly. So one way to get all these different components to actually synchronize themselves is to use a clock. So if you recall the RS NOR latch we looked at in a previous episode, the moment we actually set or reset the component, the output or rather the change actually takes effect immediately. However, while that is good, it makes it difficult to actually synchronize multiple components because of course, each component actually takes a small amount of time to react to the input changes. This is where the concept of a clock comes in. Now, let's say you have multiple logic components that were supposed to communicate with each other. What you can do is they can all accept a clock input only when the clock toggles on, thus basically one bit of processing happen. So now, essentially what we've done is we've discretized all the processing into little chunks. And these chunks of processing only happen when a clock changes. So having understood that, we can then move on to actually take a look at flip-flops, which are, well, similar to latches, except now they require a clock to work. Incidentally, one more thing I should mention about clocks, when a component is reliant on a clock signal, most of the time, the thing that triggers the component to move on to the next state is essentially the rising edge or the falling edge of the clock signal. Now, what does that mean? You see, normally the clock signal looks like this, if you plot it out. It's essentially a square wave that goes basically high and low over time. Since this is a square wave, it jumps from high to low, basically in a very short amount of time. Logic components relying on a clock signal are actually looking for these changes. In fact, this is called a rising edge because it's the edge that goes from low to high. And this is called the falling edge because it goes from high to low. The reason why we're doing this is because we want to prevent oscillation. Now remember last time when we looked at the RS NOR latch, I could actually put it in a state where oscillation happens. And essentially what that means is, well, the two states keep jumping from one to the other. In fact, for some flip-flops, there are certain things you can do to create an oscillation state. However, because, well, the whole logic doesn't go forward until your clock tells it to, it doesn't actually oscillate wildly like the RS NOR latch would. In fact, you can actually use the clock to control it and turn it into something useful. But the main reason why I'm actually bringing up this example is because I want to show you the significance of using the rising and falling edge. At the same time to demonstrate this, I'm going to actually jump in to show you the first of the flip-flops we're going to see today. So this is the T flip-flop, which is actually my favorite flip-flop because it's the easiest to understand. The component is extremely simple. It takes in one input plus one clock. It produces, well, basically just your internal state Q as output. So a few things to note here, whenever you see this symbol, that actually refers to a clock. So essentially that input is for you to actually send in your clock pulse. So what does a T flip-flop do? Essentially, a T flip-flop just means it toggles. When T is high, the internal state will change. Obviously, this only happens on a clock tick. So the truth table looks something like this. You only have four rows because you only have two variables. And that is the value of t, your input, as well as the internal state. Very simply speaking, if t is zero, then the internal state stays the same. If t is one, the internal state changes. That's literally it for a t flip-flop. That's as simple as it gets. Now, remember I was actually trying to use this to illustrate something. Now, imagine for a moment, hypothetically, if this device did not actually, you know, rely on a clock signal. 
every time I set my T to high, what's gonna happen is the internal state is going to just go crazy and oscillate wildly until I set my T back to low. And that isn't very useful because, well, how do you know what's going on? In fact, notice how these two lines in the truth table basically point to each other. As long as my T is set to 1, you keep jumping between these two stages. And if there is no clock signal to control it, then this oscillation will happen at basically a very fast pace. And that is one reason why we need a clock, because obviously the concept of toggling is a useful one, but not if we cannot control it somehow. Now let us also take this opportunity to note why we need to use the rising and the falling edge and not a high or a low. This high actually exists for a period of time. So if that was the condition required for your component to actually advance, then what that means is half the time, your component is going to oscillate wildly, and the other half of the time it's going to stay. So that doesn't make a lot of sense as well. Essentially, we only want it to move forward for a very short period of time and then wait for the rest of the time. That's why we use the rising or falling edge because the whole advancement only happens at a very quick moment. And then it actually holds onto that state for a period of time before actually moving forward again. So hopefully I've killed several birds with one stone here. You've now seen what a T flip flop is, how it works, and hopefully this would also explain some things about what a clock is for. With that, let us actually look at a few more different flip-flops. So let's move on to take a look at the D flip-flop. Now technically the name is a data flip-flop or a delay flip-flop, even though I prefer to think of it as a direct flip-flop. And the reason for that is because your input for D will actually set the internal state to that input value. So the truth table of a D flip-flop looks something like this. Whatever is my input, I just set my internal state to that input. So we move on to take a look at the last flip-flop we want to look at today, and that is called the JK flip-flop. Now, this one is actually similar to the RS knowledge in the sense that there is a set and a reset function. Essentially, a JK flip-flop looks something like this, and it's very similar to your RS knowledge, the only difference being the additional clock input. In fact, J takes on the responsibility of set, whereas K takes on the responsibility of reset. Except, this doesn't happen until the clock tells it to do so. So essentially, the truth table looks very similar to that of the RS knowledge. In fact, everything is the same except for one tiny difference. And this time, setting both J and K to 1 does not actually invalidate the input. Instead, if you set both to 1, what you basically have is a toggle condition. If you set J and K both to 1, then the internal state will toggle. And obviously, this will not work without a clock signal. And there you have it. Essentially, these are the few most commonly encountered flip-flops that, well, you probably should know. Now, in the previous episode, as well as this one, we looked at some latches and some flip-flops. Now, these are not all the latches and all the flip-flops that are out there. There are some other variants that I did not cover. However, the things that I covered are, I believe, the most common of the lot. So hopefully, well, you still learn some of the most important essentials. Anyway, that about wraps it up for this episode. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Hello, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, remember that I appreciate every like, favorite and comment you give me. If you'd like to see more from me in the future, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. And for more updates outside of YouTube, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at 0612TV. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.